My name is Dave Abbott, and I'm pleased to be here this afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, as you can see from the first slide, my topic is ceramics, and it's a topic that I've been studying for all of my professional life, so uh, a lot of uh, water under the bridge, so to speak, here. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to say a little bit about some of the methodologies that we've been using to give you an idea of how we go about figuring out things with, from the ceramics. And then secondly, to talk about some results that we've gotten over the last 20 years or so, and then uh, what those results might mean for the whole com if we have enough time at the end. Uh, I'm going to be concentrating uh, my uh, talk on the Phoenix Basin, and in particular, the lower Salt River Valley. This is a map that was put together by Jerry Howard and back in the early 1980s. It shows the Salt River coming down through the middle. The blue lines are obviously the canals, and these darkened areas are uh, Hohokam village sites. And when I'm going to be talking about it, I'm going to be talking about the ceramics from, the, from this area. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about a time period that's known as the Middle Sacatone phase, which lasts from about AD 1000 to about AD 1070. Um, what we're interested in trying to do with the ceramics is to figure out where they're being made, so the locations at which they're being produced, and then to, to follow out the distribution of those ceramics as a way of looking at interaction between different populations. And we're quite uh, fortunate to have some of the best geology in the world for doing this kind of analysis. The way that we figure out where the pots are coming from is to look at the composition of the ceramics, the temper and the clay that composes the ceramics, and then try to match those materials back to the natural landscape. And in so doing, and indicating where, the, where the, at least the raw materials are coming from, and then hopefully where the pottery is coming from. And what we have in the Phoenix area is, again, some of the best geology on the planet for this kind of work. And what makes it so wonderful is that we have a lot of diverse uh, geology, a lot of different rock types and sand types which occur, which are indicated by these different colors. Well, these are the different sand types. These darkened areas are mountain ranges. This is South Mountain. These are the Phoenix Mountains, the McDowell Mountains, the Usury Mountains, and then down along the Gila, these are the Santan Mountains. And so what we have then are these zones of sand, these aprons of sand that have been shed from these bedrock units. And what you see there are zones that are composed of different kinds of sand. And this is because we have different kinds of rock types which occur in different places within the valley. And so there's a great diversity of these rock types. And also, each of the rock types tends to occur in its own little part of the valley. So that provides then a way of being able to divide up the valley according to the sand compositions. And so using that geological landscape and then comparing that to the materials that we find in the pottery, these are thin sections. Uh, what they are are uh, paper-thin slices of ceramics which can then be examined by a petrographer who can then identify with great precision the kinds of rock and minerals that are present within the sample. And so you can see that most of this, most of the dark and red area is the clay, but then you can see various kinds of temporary materials that are, that are uh, located there. And so, by, and so by doing this kind of analysis and having the, the geology map, we're able to identify where on the landscape these different kinds of rocks, uh, these temper particles, where they came from. And another thing that we've been doing is to do a lot of sand sampling ourselves um, and going out. Uh, th these are along the middle Gila where there isn't a lot of modern development. And so in, over the years, we've spent a lot of time gathering sand samples from different washes, again, to sort of build the idea of, of where these uh, different sand types are coming from. And so what we have then is a way of identifying where the tempered material is coming from. But of course, what we want to know about is where the pottery is coming from. And one of the problems that we have, because this is so fine-grained, because we're talking about zones that are very small relative to one another, is that there's the possibility, for instance, that potters who are living here at Pueblo Grande, uh, you know, they're probably using the local sands that are coming out of, the, out of this part of the Phoenix Mountains. But um, it's quite possible that maybe some potters here were willing to go over, to, you know, walk two or three hours to get some uh, of the schist that's coming out of the Phoenix Mountains. And so if that's the case, if they're bringing these raw materials back to the local site and using local clays, then obviously the temper is not going to be a very good indicator of production source because the temper is moving around so independently of the pottery. So what we did was to turn to the clay composition. So we want to know what the, what the, what the potter's behavior was. Were the potters using locally available materials only or were some potters going larger distances to get raw materials? And the way that we resolved that question was to use um, 
a chemical analysis of the clay fraction in the pottery using a facility called an electron microprobe. And very quickly, the way the probe works is that the uh, 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 sample, which is, in our case, was a slice of the ceramic, paper-thin slice that's mounted on a glass slide, goes into the chamber. There's an electron beam that comes down and hits the sample on a very tiny little spot of the sample. It's a microanalysis. In our case, it was a spot about the size of a dot on a printed page. And because it's possible to get this backscatter image of the sample as you're, looking, as you're analyzing it, it's possible to identify exactly where in the sample you want to do your analysis. But what we do is we identify places like this where there's only clay, you're not getting the contaminating effects of the temper, and then just focusing the beam on this tiny little spot. So that would be at 300x when we're doing that. And what we found to our delight when we did all these uh, analyses is that when we find one kind of temper, we find one kind of clay so that it really looks like the temper is not moving around independent of the clay. In other words, the temper is a very good indicator of production source. And then because we were able to then, with the help of the geologists that we were working with, begin to identify the kinds of temper in a ceramic just based on using a standard binocular microscope, it was possible then to train ourselves to, to, to recognize these different kinds of ceramics. And so we've taken this very high-tech approach which relies on uh, microprobe analyses and petrographic thin sections, which is very expensive and time consuming, and essentially boil it down to a very low tech approach where we can pick up a sherd, look at it underneath the binocular microscope, and in about 30 or 40 seconds identify where that ceramic has come from. So, as a result, then we've now looked at tens of thousands of pieces of pottery in this way and be able to identify where those pots are coming from. And so, with that kind of data, then we've been able to uh, address a number of different issues, and the one that I'm going to concentrate on now is, again, the, the idea of where are the ceramics coming from that are in the Phoenix area, in the lower Salt River Valley, during the middle Sacatone phase, that is between AD 1000 and 1070. And what we have found, to our great amazement, was that there are very, very few potters who were making ceramics at that time. Now, this is very different from the situation during the subsequent classic period. In the classic period, everybody's making their own pots, and they're all making their own, a full range of vessel forms. But in the, the, the time period that precedes the classic, during the middle Sacatone phase, we, five, we find that there are only five pottery-making groups, and each of those five pottery-making groups tended to uh, focus on the production of a narrow range of vessel forms. And then we have a great deal of distribution out of those five centers of production. So I'm going to quickly go through where those five centers are located. The first is located at the site of Las Colinas, which is here. We've already said some things about that site. Um, and this is a, a site that was excavated back in the early 1980s. Uh, we had mention of David Gregory before. That's Dave facing the camera. Um, and he was uh, responsible for the excavations of Las Colinas that were undertaken by the Arizona State Museum, again, back in the early 1980s. And one of the features that was found at Las Colinas, way, down, way out on the edge of the village, was this large pit. And this pit has become known as a settling basin. And this is a chalk line that was put down on the ground for the photograph, but it shows where the margin of the pit is. And so it's about 30 feet across. It's quite large. And as you can see, it's also quite deep. It's about uh, 15, 15 feet deep. And there was another one of these basins right alongside of it. And the way that these uh, basins functioned w was that there was a canal that ran right by these, these basins. And the water from the canal and the load of suspended sediments, the clays and other material that were in the water, were dumped into these settling basins. And then the, what happened was is that the, you have this settling kind of effect where the heavier materials fall out of solution first, and the, heavy, and the lighter materials become concentrated at the top. And as this material dries, as the water evaporates, what you get is this levigation effect where you have these beautifully well-sorted clays which are formed at the top of this stratigraphic column. And you can't see it in the photograph, but there are uh, what have been called vertical lenses. These are a, a tiny, tiny lenses on the very edge of the, very edge of the pit, which were essentially fill events that were then left behind when the pit was dug out. So there's a little bit of a previous fill that was left behind when the pit was dug out. And we have a whole series of these, which is indicating that these pits were used many, many times, that they were filled and dug out, filled and dug out. And so what we have then is we have these 
a wonderful source of beautifully well-sorted clays, which were used to, uh, to make lots and lots of pottery. So what we have, what we now know is, based on the tempering materials that are in these ceramics, is that uh, the, the potters at Las Colinas were making uh, lots of large and medium-sized jars and then some bowls, but mostly large and medium-sized jars. And they're being distributed to other villages within the same canal system. With these canal systems are irrigation cooperatives. There are people, farmers, who are cooperating with one another on a regular basis to make these irrigation systems work, to deliver the water to the fields. And uh, those Las Colinas being out at the end of that irrigation system was supplying a lot of the pottery to other folks farther up canal. And then they're also supplying some of these ceramics also over into a different system called the Scottsdale Canal System. But lots and lots and lots of these pots every single year are being distributed in this way. And then the second and third pottery making groups are located down around South Mountain on the south side of the Salt River. And these potters were concentrating their production on these uh, large oyas, these water oyas. We think that they were probably used uh, to store water. You can imagine a big pot maybe sitting about this high, about this big around, sitting underneath a ramada. Water was brought to it and dumped in, and then it was just like, a, like a, a, a water cooler that was then maybe a dipper or a small bowl could be dipped inside to get a drink of water. So these, uh, and we know that there were at least two pottery making groups that were making these pots because there's two different temper types which are associated with them. Um, but we don't know exactly where those, what sites in particular those, those pots were being made. And we, do, and we do know that they're being distributed throughout the entire Salt River Valley, including, by the way, to Las Colinas, where there's tons of pottery that's being made, but they weren't making this vessel form. Instead, they were getting that pot, uh, that, those kinds of pots from the exchange. The fourth pottery making group were located down along the middle Gila. And essentially, they're making the same vessel forms that were being made at Las Colinas, large and medium-sized jars and a few bowls. And they were being distributed throughout the southern part of the lower Salt River Valley on the south side of the Salt River. So Colinas is, pr is providing the people on the north side of the river with, with these kinds of pots. On the south side, they're all coming, mostly coming from uh, the middle Gila. And then finally, we have the last pottery making group are the ones that are making the decorated ceramics, red on buffs. And they're concentrating their production on small jars, which complement these much larger plainware jars that I've already spoken about, and also bowls of various sizes. So most of the bowls that were in use at this time were these decorated forms that were all being produced on this, along the uh, Gila River. And we do know, based on Emil Howery's work at Snake Town, that there was a production area there at Snake Town that was producing buffware ceramics. So that's one place where those pots were coming from. And there's been less secure evidence to suggest that there may have been other villages not far from Snake Town that were also producing uh, buffwares at this time. And they're all located on the north side of the, Gila, of the Gila River there. Anyways, they're shipping all these pots northward to the, uh, to the Salt River Valley and so in all different locations within the valley. Okay, so this is the large ball court at Snake Town. I think it's been referenced a couple times already today. This is, as you can see, an aerial photograph. And what you're seeing there is, this is the outline of the ball court. This is the large court. This was excavated by Howery back in the 30s. And as a result, we have a lot of erosion that's taking place. This part is unexcavated, and that's why it looks more pristine. Um, so what I want to do is, I want, you, I want to ask you to think about a couple of things. First of all, that these pots are basic necessities. These are things that everybody has to have in order to, make a, to live a normal life, so to speak. So all households had ceramics. And yet, very, very few people were making ceramics during the middle sacatone phase. And these ceramics are being distributed over large distances. And so it must have been, logically, there must have been a very reliable and a very efficient mechanism to move these pots around. Otherwise, people would have made their own pots. We know that they could have done that because they did it later in the classic period when everybody was making their own pots. And so we have to ask the question, what was that mechanism? And we have some ideas that haven't been proven by any means, but there are some ideas that we put forth to suggest how that may have happened. And it revol those ideas revolve around these, these ball courts. Dave Doyle has estimated that there could be as many as 500 people that could have stood or sat on the berms of that ball court and watch what was going on be below. 
And that's an important observation because it suggests that there is probably the likelihood that large groups of people came together at these ball court events. And presumably there were people who were coming from different places, from near and far. And so this sets up the opportunity then for people to do a lot of exchange or trade with one another. They're going to be coming to this place where they know there's going to be other crowd of people, and so that's sort of a natural place for people to exchange with one another. And this is an artist's reconstruction of what uh, the ball game may have looked like uh, at that Snake Town ball court. And you can see lots and lots of people who are watching the game. But also, uh, the idea that we, we have is because these uh, ball uh, these ball courts are located very close to a central plaza, that these central plazas, at least at some of these ball court villages, may have acted as marketplaces, open air marketplaces, which were set up in association with these ball court uh, events. And again, the idea that lots and lots of people are coming to these events and probably uh, possibly bringing uh, wares for exchange with them. And so that's essentially what's shown here is that people are uh, bartering with one another while the ball game is going on. And then this is a photograph taken down in Tucson around 1910, I think it is, of O'Don women uh, essentially uh, doing the kind of behavior that we think what was going on with the Ho'okam. That is that these women are obviously potters. They've loaded up a, a backpack of these pots and they've walked from their home into uh, Tucson where there's a marketplace situation. And so they're bringing their wares to market essentially. And then we have the same thing going on probably with the Ho'okam. This is a Ho'okam ceramic. Uh, you can see that in the iconography that uh, it's being celebrated that there's lots of stuff that's moving around as well. And then this is a distribution of the, of the ball courts. Uh, my understanding is that at last count there are about 225 ball courts that are known. Almost all of them, or I guess all of them, are, in, are in, within Arizona. And uh, they're located at about 190 sites. Some, some sites, like Snaketown, for instance, has more than, more than one court but there's lots and lots of ball courts that are widely distributed. Now what's important about that is that we think about the ball courts as a, as a kind of a network, and, a, and we're thinking about it as a conduit through which lots and lots of materials could be exchanged and moved. And what's important about this distribution is that we have ball courts that are located in many different ecological zones. And this is important because what that suggests is that there are different kinds of commodities which are going to be available in some parts of the state and not going to be available in other parts. So this kind of sets up the kind of complementary relationship which you would expect to see if there is, in fact, a lot of exchange going on. So for instance, in the Phoenix area, where we have the Salt River, we have a situation where it's obviously very rich agriculturally. The potential for agriculture was very, very high. But within the valley, there are very small amounts of, of other kinds of natural resources which would have been important to the Ho'okam. For instance, for various kinds of, of uh, desert foods, plants, and as well as game that was uh, utilized by the Ho'okam, which are not available along the river. There were uh, the kind of raw material that you used to make ground stone, the manos and the matates, is, available, is not available within the valley, but is available to the north. And, uh, and there are a whole host of other things like that. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the uh, area to the north of Phoenix, what our Ho'okam archaeologists often refer to as the northern periphery, you get out away from the irrigated valleys, it's more this upland or foothill zone. There, the amount of water which is available for agriculture was considerably less, and so that area was much more marginal for, for agriculture. But that's where a lot of these wild resources were, were available. And so it's a very, again, this complementary relationship between different parts of the state which probably set up the kinds of relationships you would expect if there was a lot of exchange going on. And then finally, um, so what we're seeing then with regard to the ceramics is we're, we're talking about thousands of pots that are probably moving every year over these uh, large distances. And presumably there's lots of other stuff that's moving around as well. And again, with the idea that these ball courts are located in these different ecological zones tends to support that idea. And so what we have then is a situation where it looks like the Ho'okam were engaged in a regional kind of economy, which is something that Dave Doyle has been arguing for for years. And then we think now with the ceramics data and then some of this other data is now coming forward with regard to the obsidian and with regard to the ground stone and so forth. Uh, we, th we think now that there's some pretty good evidence that Dave was right all along and that there's a lot of this exchange that's happening on a daily basis. And so, and, and then there's one other interesting thing which is uh, coming out, which has to do with uh, 
the relationship between the lower Salt River Valley up to the north and the middle Gila River Valley to the south. Those, uh, these names are names of different canal systems. So there's a whole slew of these different canal systems along the Gila, and then of course we have the ones that we've already talked about uh, up in the salt. And what we're, what we're mentioning before was that there's an awful lot of pottery that's coming out of the Snake Town area that's going up to the north uh, on, a, on a yearly basis. We have all those plain wares, all those large jars in some bowls, and all those decorated wares are all being made along the middle Gila and going to the north. So what's going back the other way? That's a big question. What's coming back the other way? Well, what is it that the Salt River has? Well, they have a very high potential for agriculture. And if you look at those canal systems, when I look at that, it, looks, it says, suggests to me that there's an awful lot of irrigation agriculture that's going on. And perhaps, it's never been demonstrated, but perhaps we're seeing a situation where there's a lot of surplus production. And that corn and beans and, uh, and cotton was being widely distributed out of the Salt River Valley, including down to the lower Gila, to the middle Gila. Now you might say, well, the middle Gila has lots of canal systems as well, so why would they be getting farm products coming south? Well, uh, some recent study that has been done, a simulation study, has shown that looking at the amount of water that's within the river and looking at the amount of land and population that was uh, situated along the river, it looks like that in many, many years, maybe as many as one out of every two years, there wasn't enough water in the river to supply all the canal systems along the, along the river. And of course, the people who are gonna be farther up river are gonna be the first to take the water off the, off the river. And so it's likely that they're always gonna have enough water. But the question is, does the people who are living down at the far end of the canal, uh, the far end of the river, are they getting enough water? And we're talking about Snake Town. Snake Town is located down at that far end. And so where are all the pots coming from? They're all coming from the Snake Town area. And so the idea then is, is that maybe what's happening is, is that the people in the Snake Town area are trading some, many, many of these pots for agricultural goods as a way of buffering against the, the, the poor water flows along the river. If that's the case, then that is a, a radical new idea about the relationship between uh, the, the two valleys. That is, the very survival of the people along the middle Gila may have been dependent on the people of the Salt River Valley uh, in terms of the surplus production that they were producing. So if that's the case, then we have uh, a very different and I think uh, interesting idea about the Hohokam. Okay, that's it. You guys didn't get it in time. <laughs>